Warning, the five may contain discussions on topics such as death, suicide, rape, addiction, and abuse. Although these topics are approached in a therapeutic manner, they still may have triggering effects on some individuals. Viewer discretion is advised. Human beings are crafted through experience. Each person, from the closest of friend to the most random of stranger, has a unique story crafted by the ultimate experience that we call life. Welcome to the five. The same five questions, a complete different experience every time. I met today's guest through a mutual friend when we went over to a murder mystery party that he threw at his house for Halloween. We went over, we dressed up, and I ended up being a murderer. So how about you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? I actually, I, I, I was trying to think back when we actually f formally met each other, and I forgot that that was the exact time, so that that's funny. Um... Yeah, my name's Wes Adams. Um, I'm 34 years old. Um, I like to throw Halloween murder mystery parties. They're fun. It's a lot of work, though, so I don't know that I'll be doing that again anytime soon. Um, I'm married to Lindsay, uh, my wife. We live in the Knoxville area. Um, we've been here in this house for like five or six years. We travel a lot. That's what we spend most of our time doing. Um, I'm a nerd. Uh, I like sci-fi, fantasy, D&D, video games, things like that. Uh, Lindsay tries to act like she's not a nerd, but she very much is. Um, she's being converted as we speak. We got her painting minis and stuff now. Um, so yeah, we just uh, are, are pretty normal people. We're I'm, I'm from a small town about 45 minutes south of here called Etowah. Not much there. Train depot, pretty much. A few factories. Uh, and we just kind of, you know, live a normal life. We're just normal people kind of hanging out, and that's about it. I knew when we went over there and as much work as you'd put into the murder mystery party, I was like, okay, I'm going to get along with this guy because he is passionate about whatever he is working on right now. I get hyper-focused <laughs> sometimes. Uh, it, it's It's usually a good thing, but it can be a bad thing, too. Um, so, yeah, especially, like, when I got something going on, I got people coming over. Halloween especially, you know, Lindsay's big into Halloween, so I try to crank it up a little bit. Well, you know the uh, the thing we're going to, I'm going to ask you five questions. You can answer them however you want to. You ready to do it? Yeah, let's go. What's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? Scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Coming right out the out the gate with the scary stuff, huh? Um, uh, I've got a couple situations that were pretty scary. And I was kind of kind of weighing in my head which one to go with. Um, if if you if if you've been around me for any amount of time, you, you probably know these two stories I'm talking about. Um, the scariest probably was the the snake bite situation that I got into. Um, so when I was I don't know maybe I guess I was about twenty one twenty two. Uh, it was actually down on the Okoe. I know we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, that was back in the the river guiding days. We were spending a lot of time in the river, and I went to high school in Bradley Central down in Cleveland, so we spent all our time on the Okoe River. Uh, but I had a, I was living at the time with my cousin who had moved down here from Kentucky to go to Tennessee Wesleyan. I was going to Tennessee Wesleyan, uh, and my like best friend from high school. Uh, was my roommate as well. We were all at Tennessee Wesleyan. And um, I, I don't remember who it was. It was either my cousin or my roommate had like uh, met a couple people at Walmart, which that's a great place to meet people, I guess. Yeah. And they uh, were not from here. They were from Utah. I guess they were visiting like the Smokies or just East Tennessee. Um, and they wanted to kind of, you know, get a feel for the outdoorsy aspect of it. And so we were like, all right, we'll go down to the Okoe all the time. So we set up a, a camping trip down there, um, and we ended up camping. I don't. You've probably been down the river a couple times now, um, right there. Uh, sometimes a, a lot of the rafting companies stop and like ki take a kind of picnic break right there. Those two big drain pipes, what is like Go Forth Creek or something? I can't remember the name of the creek it is, but they stop at those drain pipes. Well, if you if you pull off and park right there in that little dirt area and follow that little path kind of up away from the river into the woods. Uh, it, it follows the creek up. It's beautiful, uh, like most of the area down there. 
and uh, there's a little site you can set up your your tent and have a fire right there by the side of the creek. You can hear the river and the rapids uh, down the way. So we we took them up there. There were like five of us up there total, and we were having a blast, man, doing the the camping thing, the river thing, and uh, it was sun was starting to go down, so it was it was like dusk. So. Uh, we had been having fun and goofing off, so like we didn't have a fire yet, and it was about to get dark. So I was like, "All right, well, I'm gonna walk back down to the car and and get the starter log, and we're gonna get a fire going." It's normal stuff. So uh, all of us decided to walk because we were kind of sticking together, I guess. And uh, it was dark enough that we needed headlamps, so we all had headlamps on. We were just walking down the trail, going back to the car. And I was, I, I can remember it clear as day, man. It's like kind of burned into my brain at this point. I was uh, in the middle of everybody. So there was two people on my left and two people on my right. I'm just walking down this kind of dirt trail. And I lifted my left foot up to take a step. And about mid-stride, I felt something hit my foot. And I finished the step, landed my foot on the ground, uh, and I could feel something tugging on what felt like my shoe. Felt like something was tugging on my shoe. So I immediately looked down, headlamp looks at the foot, light hits it, and I got a snake hanging off of my foot. I mean, it's bigger than that, you know, full-size snake. Um, so I immediately freaked out and started kicking. And I kicked once and landed, and it was still stuck in my foot. Kicked twice still stuck in my foot so I ran up to like the closest tree and kicked the tree <laughs> and the, the snake finally flew off and as you can imagine it's dark we all have headlamps on so as soon as everybody saw me kicking and screaming and a snake hanging from my foot everybody freaked out especially once it was off my foot because nobody knew where the snake went so everybody's losing their minds running around headlights it's dark you know it's chaos so finally, everybody calmed down, and I had on uh, Converse shoes. So I took the took the shoe off because apparently the snake had bit, and I'd gone through the the fabric of the shoe, and that's kind of what it got hung up on. So it gone through the fabric and into my foot. Uh, so that's why I couldn't get it off. And we took my sock off, and we were all five kind of huddled around my foot, just with the headlamps all pointed on it, and you could see the two punctures. Uh, and kind of a clear liquid coming out of it. And so it was at that point, we were kind of like, oh, shit, you know. That's, <laughs> it wasn't just a, a dry bite or like a, a, a chill snake. It was, it was a heavy-duty, venomous one. So we were like, well, you know, you know where that area is. That's, they, yeah, you don't, there's cell phone service probably isn't happening unless you drive a little ways. So we were like, you know, we got to go. I mean, we, I'm a 21, 22-year-old kid, man. I don't know what to do about a, a venom bite. What do you do? You seen in the movie, what do you s s try to suck out the venom? Do you do? What do you do? I don't know. I still don't know what to do, you know? So we were like, okay, well, uh, hospital. <laughs> you know, let's uh, start driving to Cleveland. That's uh, maybe like on the way we can figure something out. It didn't really hurt at the time uh, it, yet. <laughs> Uh, so I guess the adrenaline was still going and I did, wouldn't, there wasn't a lot of pain. Uh, so my, uh, this was another stupid thing we did. The way we were parked, um, I was, I was parked in the, kind of in the back and the other people that had come with us from Utah were parked kind of in front of me, blocking me in. So we couldn't take just my car and we couldn't all fit in their car. So we had the genius idea of putting me in the back of the two strangers' vehicles. Um, and they drove, and one was in the passenger seat, and I was in the back seat. And then my cousin and my roommate hopped in the car behind to follow us. So those two, those those poor two girls are probably traumatized for the rest of their lives. That was their experience in East Tennessee. I feel really bad about that, actually. <laughs> and they... Uh, they took off down, uh, I guess it's well, it's 64, right? It just runs right by the Ocoee and started heading towards Cleveland. So, you know, that river road winding, it's dark. Uh, it's kind of sketchy to drive on that winding road anyways, just because there's no median or anything. One side of it just kind of dips into the river. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, genius that I was, I guess, uh, took off my shirt, 
tied off my leg kind of below the knee and uh did like a little shirt tourniquet which i if it did anything i don't know yeah, but you know as we were driving we still had no cell phone service but it's starting to hurt a little bit you know so like i could kind of feel the uh a burn kind of spreading from the bite and then it started moving up my leg and that was concerning enough in itself but like as it was that burn would hit different muscles the muscles were contracting so then I had, I was having muscle cramps, it was burning, it was moving up my leg. So I was <laughs> in the car with those two girls that I didn't really know, and they didn't know me. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, any any luck with the cell service or, or anything like that? And they're like, no, still no service. And they're trying to call whoever. I don't even know who they were trying to call exactly, because I, who do you call? Um, and I was like, you know, we, we probably need to speed up a little bit, you know. And they were asking me why, and I was explaining what exactly was happening. So they are freaking out even more. Uh, and then it got past the point that I had tied off on my leg. So I got up into my thigh, and that whole leg tensed up. Uh, burning was still going. Got up, got into my uh, uh, stomach I'd say abs I don't really have abs but there's some kind of muscle there because they tensed up uh so that folded me over um it quickly after that got into my arms and hands my hands drew up so I couldn't pull the the t-shirt anymore and then obviously they could see something visibly was wrong with me because my hands were drawn up and I was folded over and then the uh, poor traumatized girl um, in the passenger seat <laughs> was uh, uh, asking me questions, you know, talking, trying to keep it light, while also frantically trying to get cell phone service. Um, and then it got into my jaw, and my jaw locked, and I couldn't speak anymore. Uh, it got, you know, started, you could feel it kind of the tingle in my head, uh, and everything just kind of locked up, so I was fully contracted locked up uh, we got more into town going down 64 and uh i can't I'm trying to remember that is that big sign still on the side of 64 like halfway between it's like okoe outdoor rafting or whatever massive sign <laughs> you know right there on the right if you're going towards cleveland uh we finally got cell phone service and they called 911 at this point because i was you know tensed up and couldn't speak and I basically all I could move was my eyes, which is a scary feeling. Um, hence the point of this story. <laughs> um, and we, I heard him get a hold of nine one one, so that was a relief. And uh, about the time we got almost to that big sign, uh, we saw the lights of two police cars and an ambulance coming down the other side of sixty four, and they passed us. So we were flashing their lights, and she called back and was like, hey, we're in the car that you guys just passed. And she pulled over right at that sign. Um, and I was still, I couldn't do anything. I was tensed up, but I saw the lights kind of pull up behind us. And the two cops stopped behind us, and the ambulance went around in front of us. And I was just like, all right, well, I got a chance now. I've, you know, I, th That's good. I might actually make it. Um, so the, the cops got to... Uh, the back passenger door first and pulled me out like uh, kind of grabbed me and pulled me out onto the shoulder of the of the highway and so I'm just laying there uh, still all tensed up and they were asking me what had happened um, what was going on I don't know if they thought I had like taken a substance or if I'd done something stupid um, but I couldn't tell them <laughs> because I was <laughs> my jaw was locked uh, and I couldn't move so I was just seemingly seizuring um so the girls were telling him it was a snake bite and then uh i don't some people have this but i'm like horribly phobic of needles like i'm not scared of a lot of stuff like i can you know bugs spiders blood whatever no it's hard to bother me but a, like a, a needle a syringe or like giving blood really I like I, I I all pass out like I don't do well at the doctor getting shots so I see the back two doors of the ambulance fly open um and two paramedics hop off and as they're like jogging towards me I see them pulling caps off of syringes and I'm 
can't move. <laughs> I'm just looking up at this horrible scene running at me with the needles. And uh, one hit me in the leg and one hit me in the chest. And pretty much immediately all the muscles relaxed. I um, mean, I could talk. It loaded me up on the ambulance, took me into uh, that hospital there in Cleveland. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and they had me, wheeled me off the uh, the ambulance and wheeled me into the hospital. And they're kind of rushing me back to a, a room to check me out. And as they're doing that, there's a little nurse jogging along beside me with a clipboard. And she's explaining, you know, best case scenario, uh, you're probably losing your foot. Worst case scenario, we might have to cut off a little more. So we need you to sign this uh, sheet of paper saying we can amputate whatever we need to to save your life. So I was like, oh, all right, I mean, what do you do? <laughs> he signed the paper, you know. Uh, so then they got me back into a room, checked me out. I got lucky because for some reason, one of the leading venom experts in the country happened to be in Chattanooga at the time. So they helicoptered him up to Cleveland that night and he came and checked me out. Um, they were asking us all a bunch of questions about, you know, what kind of snake bit me. I was hell, I don't know. I was, I was just, it was it was dark and I had a headlamp on and it was hanging off my foot. I wasn't like paying attention to the color or the pattern on it, you know. Um, so there's apparently two different types of venomous snakes in East Tennessee. There's timber rattlers and copperheads. So it was one of those two, but we didn't know which one. So uh, Mr. Venom Expert didn't feel comfortable giving me uh, any anti-venom because if there's basically a 50-50 coin flip that he gave me the wrong one and then I had a double envenomation. So that would have just made it worse. So basically, uh, I had to sit there in the hospital for about nine days and just kind of ride it out. Uh, and my foot ballooned up. I mean, huge. And... uh They'd have to come in like every hour, every couple hours and lance my foot open and let it drain. And I was out of commission for probably three, four months, man. Like after I got home, I was on crutches. Like I couldn't really lower my foot below my heart because if I did and the blood rush to it, it would just be like crippling pain. And uh, I still can't feel three of my toes on that side of the foot. Uh, it killed some of the kill some of the muscle in the arch so I have to technically if I do anything really like athletically demanding sprinting stopping running a lot of jumping I gotta wear a, a special insole uh but other than that no lasting damage uh but that was that was pretty scary man like that was I've, I've been in a lot of a lot of weird situations uh but that was one I can legitimately look back on and be like I thought I was dying you know, <laughs> I thought that I thought that was it. So that was scary. I mean, you got a snake bot in the middle of the night, which is already scary. You get uh, this long hospital ride and I know the road and it's like in the middle of nowhere on that curvy road. That's scary. And then for them to be like, well, we're probably going to cut off your foot. And you are in the hospital for nine days those whole nine days you've got to be thinking is today they cut off my foot because i would be thinking that you know i would be thinking like it could still happen you know that's scary uh, yeah yeah and they, there wasn't a whole lot of updating um so when they'd come in and, and lance the foot i was like all right cool you know they're doing this so they don't have to cut it off but i i was like it's not really getting better about you know about that third fourth day then definitely about the fifth, sixth day, I was like, oh, God, this isn't, like, really, this isn't getting much better, so this is probably bad. <laughs> but then it finally turned the corner and worked out, so I guess I got lucky. If you want to consider that lucky, I don't, I don't know. But that was scary. Just this last weekend on the Okoe, I'm doing the whitewater raft guide training and everything, and it's all guides that's in the uh, raft and everything. And we had a new guide in the back. And she crashed us into, like, the bank, and we went under some of the low-hanging trees there. Well, I hear a thump, and I look over, and, like, the guy beside me, he's just got a snake in his lap. It fell out of the tree into his lap, and he didn't even realize it. He's just, like, rowing away. And I'm like, hey, man, there's a snake in your lap. And, of course, when he sees it, he just starts backpedaling and everything. And I take my oar and flip it right out of the raft. But then the God is like, 
oh gosh. He's like, was that a snake? And I was like, yeah. He goes, yeah, those things freak me out. He goes, sometimes we're like taking the waves and it'll just deposit a snake in the boat. And I was like, man, if Raph got, he wasn't like dangerous enough. Now we got snakes. Got to watch out for snakes. Yeah. <laughs> really Indiana Jones job, right? It's a... Uh... I mean, it, yeah, if you think about it, it's the nature of whitewater. It's a, it, it has to be rocky for there to be rapids. So the, those snakes love laying out on those rocks. They get up into the trees. There's a, a watch out around that, that spot. I, I think it's Goforth Creek. Uh, that spot with the two storm drains, they're there for sure. I can, I can vouch. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, quite a bit more cautious because also my uh, water shoes right now, I've found uh, Converse is perfect for getting there and holding myself into the boat. So now I'm kind of scared. You probably got a, a stronger bit of venom. Oh, uh, so you've been wearing Converse? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, yeah, they, they actually said that one of the reasons it was so severe is because it, it was a younger snake, so they can't control the release as well. Uh, and it was stuck in the fabric of my shoe, so it, it was just pumping. Just pumping, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I got got to do things to extreme, man. Nothing, nothing easy. Nothing mild. <laughs> nothing worthwhile is ever easy. Oh, man. Well, I guess we can move on to the next one, which is what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you. I mean, the the weirdest thing is probably that I've had a lot of weird stuff happen to me, man. So that that's hard to pick. I mean, really, just because of the nature of it and just the situation surrounding it, it's probably the gunshot. Um, but I've I, that's that's probably the toughest question I had, just because there's I got way too many options to pick from there. Um, as far as the gunshot goes, I did get shot. Um, I I tell that story pretty openly now, but there for a while after it happened, I kept it pretty close to the vest because. I mean, when you say that to people, I mean, especially, uh, you know, when I was in my mid late twenties telling that story to people, when you say you've been shot, their immediate response is, well, what the hell were you doing to get shot? <laughs> like, what, what, it doesn't sound good. You know, the answer to that is nothing. <laughs> I was trying to go about my daily life. Uh, I wasn't doing anything bad or illegal. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I got shot in the, uh, shoulder about right here with a 45 caliber, caliber handgun. Um, it was just the whole, what makes it weird is really just the whole situation. If that getting shot isn't weird enough. Um, I was working at Valvoline at the time. Um, I was not long out of college. I think I was like 25, 26, maybe. Um, so I graduated when there weren't really jobs available is the housing crash and all that. So I worked at Valvoline cause I needed money. Uh, I was changing oil all day. Uh, and the, uh, girl I was dating at the time, her brother was getting married the next day. So this was Friday. Um, and I had been at work. I had worked like a 10 hour, 11 hour shift. I'd been under a car all day in the blistering sun <laughs> you know just getting hot oil poured on my head hating life just it's so pissed and miserable dirty just got off work wanted to do nothing else but go home and take a shower and like watch some tv that's all i wanted to do and uh yeah so that that guy was getting married the next day saturday morning and uh i don't know why he felt like he needed to ask me to be one of his groomsmen, but he did. I guess, I don't know if he felt obligated or whatever. But you, I mean, when somebody asks you to do that, you're, you you kind of do it. So I was like, all right, sure, man. Um, so I was, you know, wanted to get some sleep to get up early to go do all that the next day because it's going to be a busy day. I still hadn't picked up my, you know, suit, tux or whatever that I had to wear. So I had to go do that early Saturday morning. And as soon as I get home, I get a phone call from him and it's like, hey, uh, the girls in the wedding party are having a girls night and I wouldn't call it a bachelorette party because they didn't really do anything. They just kind of went out together and I don't know, went and ate or something and spent the night at each other's house or something. I, I don't know. Um, but he was like, 
you know, uh, I could, I mean, it's the night for my wedding. I kind of want to, you know, do something. B, I want to be sitting here by myself. And I was like, oh God, all right, man, that's fine. And so I took a shower and I drove over to Maryville where he was staying at the time. He was actually living with his grandma in his grandma's basement. Um, and I went over there and I was like exhausted and I was like, all right, man, what, what do you want to do? Um, and he was like, he was big into, you know, hunting, fishing, all that jazz, Blunt County kid, you know. So he was like, let's go down to the shooting range and shoot a little bit. He's like, I got some fireworks. I got, we'll go shoot at the targets. It'll be fun. I was like, ah, oh, whatever, dude. All right, fine. Well, the the guy and his family have an arsenal. I mean, guns on guns on guns on guns. And the shooting range is about 15, 20 minutes down the road. So we were loading up everything. So we were down in his, in the basement, uh, cinder block basement, you know, unfinished, uh, just pretty much a big table in the middle. And we were unloading all of the guns before we put them in the car. So in case we got pulled over, we didn't get pulled over with a, a, enough weapons to, you know, have an army in our trunk. So we were going through, popping all the clips out, all the magazines out, and, you know, taking them out, taking the bullets out of the chamber. And uh, he got to a, a little Taurus 45 handgun and popped the magazine out and tossed it away, and there was one in the chamber. So he was standing, I don't know, about five, six feet from me, about from me to the bedpost back there, and uh, pulled the slide back to shoot the round out the side and got about back like this about halfway back and his hand slipped slide slam forward and the gun discharged and I was facing him we were facing each other and big bang goes off cinder block basement shell shock can't hear anything my ears are just ringing and I open my eyes and I'm looking the other direction <laughs> so I had been hit and it had hit me in the shoulder, spun me complete 180, and I was looking the other direction. Can't hear anything, just, you know, shell shock. Uh, it, it felt like somebody just ran up and haymakered me in, like, the shoulder. It, it didn't sting, it didn't burn, it just felt, it was just an impact. Like, it was just like somebody punched me really hard. Um, and I remember the first thing I did, I was yelling because I couldn't hear, but I... I knew I'd gotten shot that registered pretty quickly and I went like this and I was like I remember turning and looking at him and he's just you know full shock <laughs> like oh my god I just shot him <laughs> <laughs> which must have been terrifying in itself um and I remember screaming I think it was a meat hit I'm fine <laughs> but I was like yelling it now because I was like I think it was just a through and through meat shot I think I'm okay and he was like, what do we do? And I was like, we're both shouting at each other as loud as we can at this point. And I was like, we got to go to the hospital, man. I just got shot. Like, we got to go to Blunt Memorial. And he's like, all right, I'll drive you. And his, his gray, like I said, he was living at his grandma's house. She was upstairs the whole time watching TV. Heard a gunshot go off and heard me and him screaming at each other back and forth. Never came down. Never checked on it. I never saw the. I did not see that lady until the next day at the wedding. Like, d I was totally unconcerned. Or just, I don't know what happened. She was probably being smart if she hears arguing in a gunshot. Or not arguing, but yelling in a gunshot. She's just like, she's like, uh, well, if it's my baby, I'm not going to turn him into the, the cops anyway. I guess she heard a gunshot. And heard two voices screaming, so she was like, okay, well... <laughs> Turn that TV up. Nobody got shot, yeah. Crazy. Um, that's insane to me. That, that, like, thinking back on that after the fact, that is mind-blowing to me, that that lady was just, like, literally heard me get shot and us yell at me. She heard a gunshot. Heard somebody go, I think it was a meat shot, I'm okay. And the other guy go... What do we do? And I was like, I just got shot. We got to go to the hospital. Never even left her couch. You're not going to miss a 45 shot in a cinder block basement. No, absolutely not. In the middle of a neighborhood. 
Um, so we went and got in the truck <laughs> and, uh, he started driving me to Blunt Memorial. And at this point, uh, similar to Snake Bite, man, it's still not really hurting. Uh, he, I, he had a towel in his truck, so I kind of was holding it on my shoulder and I was, I was cussing him the whole way to the hospital. I was, at this point, it, there wasn't any pain, so I was just pissed. I was just mad. So I was just go. I was just cussing him up one side and down the other. Luckily, Blunt Memorial wasn't that far away. So we got there. He dropped me off at the emergency door and went to park. <laughs> and I went walking in. I mean, there was so much blood. There was, I mean, my entire left side of my sh- I was just red. It was a green shirt. And the whole half of it, I was soaked in blood. That towel was soaked all the way through with blood. So, I I mean, I looked like a murder victim walking through the emergency room. And I distinctly remember the counter at the emergency room, the lady sitting there, and there was a person in front of me in line. And I walked up and stood behind her in line, and she was complaining about a stomach ache. And... She was just going through her spiel, and she gave her the paperwork, and she asked what what if she still had the same insurance. And I, was, I was just I was just like, oh, I don't know what to do here. And she went and sat down. Finally, kind of gave me a weird look because I'm covered in blood. As she passed me, and I walked up to the lady at the counter, and I was like, I got a gunshot, and her eyes got real wide, and she hit a little button under the table, and people came running out the double doors in the, the, the hallway and threw me on a gurney and took me back. They were all freaking out. Um, they were a fun story. If you get shot and it is just a meat shot, I'm never going to tell you not to go to the hospital because you never know if it's a meat shot or not. But if it doesn't hit an organ, if it doesn't hit any bone, if it's a through and through, it's really not worth going to the hospital because they can't really do anything. They pretty much clean it out and sanitize it and put a piece of gauze on the entry and exit wound because apparently it has to heal from the inside to uh, push out any potential infection. So they don't they don't stitch it up. They don't they give you some painkillers and put some gauze on it. It's, ba- it's basically it. So I had a doctor shining a flashlight in my gunshot wound and it had gone all the way through entry and exit uh, and he was cleaning it out. It was kind of kind of funny at the time it was funny after I got my medication um (laughs) it wasn't funny before then uh but he was shining that light and cleaning it and occasionally he'd be spraying the saline solution into the hole and the light would be hitting it and he'd clean it out enough you could see it go through and shine a little bit of the light on the wall behind me (laughs) oh god um and then uh TBI showed up Tennessee Bureau of Investigation because if you don't know, any time a person gets shot, there they show up. Um, and uh, they were asking, they came to interview both of us. And uh, <laughs> it's another weird thing about it, man. We were both, I mean, we were I was kids. I mean, early 20s, mid 20s. Uh, so I, and he was getting married the next day, remember. <laughs> Nobody knows this has happened yet except us and his grandma, who obviously doesn't care. It's not concerned with it. Um, we were like, we got to come up with a story. Like, well, you're going to be in trouble. Like, we, you're, ma- you're getting married tomorrow. Like, you're, this is gonna, your wife's going to lose her mind. And uh, so we came up with... <laughs> we, we came up with uh, some absolutely ridiculous story about squirrel hunting um like we we made we spun it like a hunting accident <laughs> with <laughs> squirrels yeah we yeah oh god i don't that tbi guy had to have been like but we both told the same story and i was okay and i i distinctly remember him sitting in there and kind of looking at me and being like you're sure this was an accident? And I was like, yeah, dude, squirrels. It was, we were, yeah, it was an accident. He did not mean to. He absolutely did not mean to. 
He's like, blink twice if this was not an accident. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, the st- it was an outrageous story, man. Two guys were out in the woods on a Friday night with a forty-five hunting squirrels, and one of them got shot in the, like, upper body. It's such a stupid story. Oh, God. It's so, uh, I, I had, then I had to call my parents after the TBI guy left and they confiscated the weapon and they actually went to his basement. The, the TBI agents went to his basement to see the scene of the shooting. He took them back there while I was still at the hospital getting treated. And the grandmother still never made an appearance. An entire tbi investigation took place in her basement that she just heard a gunshot and two people screaming in never checked it out and then i had to call my parents uh and called my stepdad uh trying to get a hold of my mom and was like hey uh, i got shot and that's a fun conversation to have um so they came up to the hospital and uh they kept me overnight um because the bullet had hit my clavicle running across here so my clavicle had just essentially exploded into a bunch of little uh shards of bone which uh got lodged into the muscle and tissue around the the gunshot so they had to keep an eye on it and uh see if uh any of those larger shards of bone uh didn't come loose uh, because if they didn't come loose they were going to have to do surgery to remove them um, and then I got released the next morning. Uh, my mom drove me over and we picked up my suit tuxedo from the place. <laughs> like I said, um, just two pieces of gauze on the entry and exit wounds and cleaned it out real good. So I didn't have a sling. I didn't have nothing. I had two pieces of gauze and, uh, picked up my suit and I had to be at the uh wedding it was actually on the uh you know Calhoun's down there on the river behind the stadium in Knoxville that boat that does the dinner cruises it was on that boat um so (laughs) I was there 10 o'clock in the morning in my suit fresh gunshot wound the only two people that knew that it had happened were me and him still we did not tell anybody else Um, because it was his wedding. It was his wedding day. Um, so we did not want that whole situation that the groom had shot one of his groomsmen the night before with a forty-five to throw off the whole wedding. So we didn't tell anybody. Um, so I had to go through that whole wedding on that boat with a, a forty-five gunshot wound that I had gotten about 12 hours earlier. (laughs) Um, try to play it off and made it through the whole wedding day reception after thing and then uh it, then I, I guess they I don't know when they finally told his wife but she was not happy about it uh but yeah he almost ru- that, that almost that very easily could have ruined that whole wedding and you could have died what's new <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah that was weird that was weird. If you've never been in a wedding with a gunshot wound, it's, it's a little weird. Um, I guess that's the word I'd use to describe it. <laughs> so yeah, that's my weird story. Everybody that doesn't live in t- like Tennessee or the South, welcome to the South. That's going to sound very weird to anybody not from this area. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not, I promise it's, I, well... I'd I'd say I promise it's not really like that, but it is, it kind of is. So it kind of is. Now I'm interested to hear what the next one is, which is what's the most memorable moment of your life so far. Memorable moment. I got a, I got a, I've got a lot of memorable moments. A lot. I've been in a lot of situations. Um, honestly, I thought about this one a little bit because we travel a lot. You know, we we've. We went to Peru last year. We're going to we're going to Iceland um, in end of September, start of October. You guys, I think, just got back from there, right? It's amazing. Pumped about it. Super pumped about it. Uh, but you know, we've we've traveled South America and Central America uh, pretty decently. Australia, New Zealand. We we get around. We've seen a lot of beautiful, amazing things. Had a lot of really cool experiences. Um, but honestly. My most memorable experience is a is a pretty 
pretty simple one. Um, it was, I think, I'm trying to remember exactly when, I think it was, it was the day before I was proposing to Lindsay. So the story behind all that is we have um, really good friends that are uh, wedding photographers and uh, videographers, and uh, they've they, they hit it pretty big. They're they're very popular with a lot of people because um, uh, they're very talented. Um, they take beautiful photographs and do these amazing videos for people, um, and they're very much in demand. But there was a, a Lindsay knew them and introduced me to them. Uh, kind of from the beginning of them starting to do photography even and in the beginning they were doing more artistic stuff just kind of personal stuff um and uh when things started taking off they started uh traveling a lot uh, doing people's weddings and just you know whatever uh, business wise um but they decided they were going to go to Australia and New Zealand and uh they invited us along and initially i was like no way dude i can't afford it i can't go to australia man i didn't have a job that paid anything near what i needed to be able to go to australia uh, but we planned way ahead and ended up going and i was like dude when else am i going to be in australia on the other side of the world um, so on top of doing all that i saved up the money and uh got a hold of this custom jewelry maker and made a ring to propose to Lindsay because I wasn't going to pass up that opportunity. That's, that's a, you know, it's a hell of a story. And, uh, we were going with our friends who were very good photographers and they, uh, agreed to help me out with the whole thing and, uh, actually got the whole proposal and all that, uh, on, on video and took pictures of it. And it was, it was really cool. But the day before that, um, back to the story, sorry, I ramble. Um, the day before that we had, uh, we were in Byron Bay, Australia, which now is a big, uh, Instagram hipster spot. Um, but we, uh, had flown into Sydney or flown into Mel Melbourne, Melbourne. Was it? No, it's Brisbane. We'd flown into Brisbane and rented a car. So we were driving, we had our own car and we drove down to Byron Bay and we had heard about this place, uh, northeastern part of Australia is very much rainforesty. Um, it's beach and rainforest, essentially. Um, so we were staying at the beach, and we'd heard about this place further inland, kind of deep into the rainforest, an hour and a half, two hours into the rainforest from Byron Bay, um, that was uh, famous for its marijuana. Um, it's, it's actually a hippie commune. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. They'd probably be offended by whatever I tried to call it, but I, closest thing I know to call it from other places I've seen and been, it's like a hippie commune. It's literally this small village town in the middle of the rainforest and it's called Nimbin, N-I-M-B-I-N. If you haven't heard of it, it's worth a Google search. Um, and they're actually famous for a, a big uh, hemp festival that they have every year. They turn it into like this whole big thing with a parade and uh, everybody kind of descends on that area. But when that's not happening, it's a very small village and everybody that lives there, um, they don't really have their own houses. They don't have their own money. The whole community just kind of works the shops and farms and puts all their resources into a community pool. And they all share it. Um, it's very communish. So we decided to go out there. <laughs> um, and uh, that was a whole experience in itself. But on the drive back, um, we had just had this super cool experience with all these super cool people. And I was driving a back road through the rainforest in Australia. And I had the ring in my pocket and uh, you know, two of my best friends in the car with me and the girl I was going to propose to the next day. And it was just happy, dude. You know, it was just good vibes all around. It was, uh, uh, and, uh, we were just listening to the radio. The windows were rolled down. It was beautiful outside. And, uh, we were playing 
songs on Britney uh, was the photographer was playing songs off of her phone and uh, they played a song by Rainbow Kitten Surprise, First Class, uh, which if you you know that song, I know, but for those that don't know that song, it's, it's I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like their slower romantic kind of, it's kind of got this sad feel, but this romantic kind of hopeful feel to it too. It's weird. Um, but it was the first time I'd ever heard Ray Mo Kitten Surprise, and it was the first time I'd ever heard that song. And uh, nobody was talking. We were just all happy. And at that moment in time, driving through the rainforest in Australia with the windows down, here at Rainbow Kitten Surprise First Class for the first time, with those people and with my future wife in the car, everything seemed good, man. You know, and I can I can remember it, and uh, that's that's a memory I go back to often. You know, it's, you you've got to have memories like that because I can I can be there right now if I close my eyes, and there is nothing bad about that memory. Like that at that's if I could freeze frame that moment in time, that's like. There was nothing but hope and positivity and good things. I didn't, that, that's one of the few times in my life I can legitimately say I did not have a care in the world. Like I did, I didn't care. I, if I never made it back from Australia, if I never made it out of that rainforest, it was all good. Like everything was cool. Everything was going to be okay. Everything was going to be fine. And I was surrounded by people that cared about me and loved me and everything was all good so like those moments are rare you know that that that's rare uh so that is probably that trumps all of the other crazy nonsense like we've been to machu picchu we've been to cusco we've been to medicine colombia we've seen costa rica we've seen new zealand australia we've been all over the place I've seen it, all the beautiful things, uh, but nothing really holds a candle to that. So that that's probably my most memorable. That sounds like perfection. It's great, man. <laughs> I I try if I could bottle it, <laughs> you know, I'd be wealthy. And also, that's when you know it's right because you're about to do like a life changing kind of what a lot of people stress out about. But like, it when it's right, you can you can have that moment and just enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, and that was uh, that's one of the aspects of my life that I was very lucky in, uh, because there wasn't there wasn't ever that concern or worry or or fear. Um, there's always that nervousness when you're going to do it, but it wasn't a nervousness of like anything was going to go wrong or I was making a mistake. It was more just the nervousness of being in such a big life moment and not wanting to do something stupid <laughs> or look stupid or say something stupid. Which uh, is a chronic problem of mine. Um, <laughs> so I was really lucky in that aspect because I, I, I wasn't worried. Like I, I couldn't wait. You know, it was, it was really cool. That sounds amazing. I hate to bring it down, but the next question is: What's the saddest moment of your life? Unfortunately, same memory. No, I just, I just get this. <laughs> I just, <laughs> she's gonna be mad when she watches this. <laughs> Had to get that one in though. Uh, saddest, uh, you know, everybody has sad stuff they got to deal with. It's it's part of the the human experience. It's kind of what makes all the uh, the good stuff good. It's you got to have that balance, um, or else you don't appreciate the good times. Um, but probably the saddest thing that ever happened was only a few years ago. Um, it was, uh, people around this area are probably familiar with it. The, uh, the Cookville tornado, uh, back in 2020, early March, uh, that was, that was a mess. Um, that was basically right at the start of COVID too. Um, I think it was like that, cause I remember that whole tornado happened and Trump had come and toured the the location and literally like less than a week later he was making the announcement about you know the whole breakout of COVID and the country shutting down and all that but the tornado um I when that all went through um for those that don't know a tornado came through Cookville in early March 
it was I think very early in the morning. I think it was like 2 a.m. when it hit um, because of the nature of weather systems. I don't know how they work, um, but there was no warning, um, and it ended up uh, killing, I want to say, I don't want to, I mean, I don't know the exact number. It was 16, 19, somewhere in there. A lot of people. Um, and one of the highest concentration of casualties was a small neighborhood that was kind of a circular neighborhood right beside a church in Cookville. And uh, my uh, cousin and his wife and their uh, two-year-old son uh, lived in that neighborhood and were killed, um, which is very sad in itself. Um, my aspect, uh, where I come into play in that, um, I had that entire week before been very sick. I had like a 104 degree fever and had to go to the doctor and been out of work for like a week, week and a half. And that day that the tornado happened was going to be my first day back to work. Uh, and I work, I work for the state of Tennessee, um, as a, uh, an OSHA compliance officer. So I, I go around and do inspections um, at businesses uh, to enforce safety and health regulations. Um, so I was planning on doing an inspection that day. So I'd gotten up early, very early. Um, and I remember shortly after getting up and putting my clothes on, getting a call from my mom, which was very strange because it was like three, four-ish in the morning. Uh, there was, you get a, you get a call from a family member at that time, something's wrong, you know? So I of course answered it and she was like, there's been a tornado in Cookville. Um, they can't find, uh, Josh and Aaron, which was my cousin and his wife. Um, his, uh, parents were at the hospital in Cookville because apparently that was, uh, where they were bringing some of the, uh, injured people. That was kind of the base of operations at the time. Um, and they're trying to track him down or find out any information. And I was like, all right, you know, um, as the nature of my job, we deal with disasters and accidents, fatalities, amputations, things like that. And we are also trained on emergency response. So if there's a big disaster, we had some people from our organization go down and help with Katrina, uh, help with, uh, safety and health during the uh cleanup at the twin towers so we're we're trained on emergency response so we know the terms to use we know how the setup goes so i was like all right i've got i'm dressed professionally i was going to an inspection um i let me put in some manual leave and i will leave right now and drive that way and see if i can like get in there and see what's going on uh so i got there his in Cookville, so about what an hour and a half drive from Knoxville. I uh, got there to the hospital, met up with his parents. Uh, the whole waiting room that they were putting people in was uh, full of just people like his parents that were missing people from that area, couldn't get a hold of their loved ones, were trying to find out any information. Um, at this point, the hospital is getting absolutely flooded with people um, injured deceased uh people trying to find their people um so it's 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 a chaotic situation um the doctors and nurses don't know who's there for the most part um, they're still trying to identify people identify victims that are coming in so i talked to them and told them i was going to try to uh, i got their address i told them i was going to try to get through the scene to get to the house to the neighborhood to see if i could try to find somebody who had seen them try to track them down uh i guess um word got out around that little room um that i was gonna try to get to the ground zero and i had uh, a, a bunch of people that were all from the same church uh, that were there too they were coming up to me and they were trying to uh, give me pictures um, and give me the names and stories of the people that they were looking for. And I was, you know, taking all their pictures and their information down. And uh, the the main, I think the main group that everybody was looking for um, was 
I think it was one of the youth pastors um, in his family. It was like him and his wife, young couple, and their two little daughters. Um, so I took down all their information, and I was going to keep an eye out for them and try to track down them while I was in there too. And I got back into the uh, actual emergency area with the nurses and doctors and was like going door to door and trying to uh, see if I could find any of them. Um, and it was hard because uh, they hadn't ID'd everybody yet. Um, so there were a lot of rooms that were just, you know, unknown written on the on the chart. Uh, and then you'd have to go in there and... Uh, see if you could identify anybody you knew couldn't nobody there knew or thought they had seen anybody that looked like any of them so I got in the car and drove through kind of ground zero of this you know tornado disaster and it 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 leveled leveled Cookville um it was like driving through a a war zone um everything well, it's weird seeing kind of society as you know it. It kind of turned upside down. Um, I made it to the neighborhood. Um, there was a small church right at the base of the neighborhood before you actually turned the corner and went into it. Um, and that's where they had set up kind of a, a makeshift incidents command. Um, and they had a mobile morgue there. Um, and I stopped and went in there and introduced myself, um, and told them kind of what I was doing there. And I was like, you know, I'm here to help any way I can. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to find these people. Um, these are family members and I, I just told them they were all family members cause I didn't really feel like diving into the whole explanation of it. Um, and they were nice enough to uh, show me the neighborhood. There wasn't much to see. Um, every, pretty much every house in that neighborhood, there was nothing left but concrete foundations. Um, so uh, we didn't have a lot of equipment there. It had been raining, so it was muddy, nasty. Um, so we were all pretty much just digging through mud and dirt and rubble. Um, and not not much was found uh, that was alive. Um, so that was, that was a whole experience, uh, going through that, that day. Um, we, I I mean, I finally found some people walking around there that had been from that neighborhood and survived and they, uh, filled me in on some information and, uh, finally was able to track everybody down. Um, nobody made it. Um, there was uh, uh, my cousin and his wife and their uh, their two-year-old son uh, all passed away. Um, and fortunately, that other family I was trying to help find, um, several of them did survive. Um, uh, but one was pretty critical condition. Um, so just, yeah, man, just, just going through that. And, uh, it, it, I think it was doubly hard just because that whole area was pretty much blocked off to anybody in the general public. It was only emergency response. And, and, uh, I had, I had to keep going in and going out, um, because it took a long time to track down everybody. So uh, I'd have to come back and get some drinks or something to eat. And pretty much every time you go back to that main location where everybody's sitting around waiting to hear any kind of word, uh, it it was me, you know. So I've got an entire town full of people sitting there waiting to hear if their loved one is gone, hurt, still alive. So uh, anytime I walk into a room, that room full of people, it's just all eyes on me. Hey, hey did, you, did you hear anything? Did you see anybody? Did, did any? And it's really hard to be in that situation and not have any good news. Um, and it, it, it was very difficult 
a lot of times having to, uh, there was a period of time throughout that where I had been the only one of the neighborhood and I had seen what it looked like and I'd seen the mobile morgue and all that and seen some of the people uh, that they had been looking for. Uh, um, and it, they're looking to you for information when you go back and you have to kind of ride the balance of the people you haven't seen for sure. Um, you have to walk a thin line of, I haven't seen them. I haven't found them deceased. So there is still a potential they are out there somewhere and okay. And also temper those expectations in a, I don't even know how to describe it, man, in a uh, empathetic way um, that it doesn't look good. Uh, so that that was hard, um, especially when there's little kids involved. And when I say little kids, it's like six and under, you know, uh, toddlers sometimes. Um, so, yeah, that day was a lot of sadness, uh, a lot of worry, a lot of death, a lot of just unpleasant things. And uh, the I, I'd say that's the one day in my life where just the overall description of the entire experience was just sad. It was it was just sad, man. It, there were some beautiful things that came out of it. Um, you know, there were, I think, like, part of the way through the day after they figured out what was going on with the tornado and how many people were injured and killed, they, they set up, like, a blood drive. And a ton of the kids from Cookville, the universe, what is it? Is it tech that's out there? Yeah, a ton of the kids. I mean, I, can, I remember I had just left that mobile morgue and come back to the hospital to try to, like, tell everybody what I'd found out one of the times and I got back there and there was a line wrapped from the front door like all around the back of the building of just like kids like uh like college kids that were just coming in between class to like give blood and help however they could and uh that whole community of Cookville and like the EMTs and the, the emergency rescue people were all great like they were like you said it, it was it was it was two opposite ends of the emotional spectrum um so you saw like the best most beautiful side of humanity um and also one of the saddest things you can probably experience as as a human being all wrapped up into one which i mean i guess that's part of it right that's that's the human experience it's a uh, uh horror and beauty uh in the extremes of things um and that that was yeah that was just sad man that was just that was rough um so hopefully uh not many more days like that and uh more days like rainforest in australia you know those days like that make you really appreciate rainforest days in australia very much so very much so. I'll never forget those uh, tornadoes because I'd actually, a literate lot was playing the night before in Nashville. And I went down with your wife. Lindsay was there, yeah. <laughs> yes, there was like a little speakeasy right down from it. And there was a bus stop that we all like stopped at and everything. And the next day we got up and like the weather, it would have been cold that night. I remember... You know when Lindsay's going to a concert, like you're setting out in the cold at the front of that line. All day. All day. All day. And so it was cold and everything, and then we wake up the next morning, and it's like hot outside. And I, you really just get the sense of feeling like something's wrong here. Like it, the weather shouldn't have changed that much. And then every place that we went, including the venue where we saw a literate lot, the speakeasy that was there right beside it was all destroyed by those tornadoes. Those tornadoes went from Nashville to Cookville. That is a huge amount of, you know, miles and everything and just left destruction and death. I, I know the uh, bartender that served us at the speakeasy that night, he passed away in the in those tornadoes too. That was Basement East, right? Yep. Yeah, I think it destroyed that whole venue. I think they had to, they had to rebuild. 
Yeah, so those were bad, man. Uh, the one that hit, uh, the, the only one I can really speak for is the one in Cookville because that's the one I was involved in, like, the rescue and cleanup. Uh, and was there shortly after it happened. But that, that that was like an F4. So it was it was no joke, man. Like I said, when I got when I got to that kind of ground zero area, that neighborhood, there were that there was just foundation left. Like there wasn't uh that I don't know what you would have done if you had a couple minutes warning because I if you got in the closet, if you got in the bathtub, if you got in the basement it did way it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered cuz there was nothing but foundation like concrete and dirt we went to uh Cummings Falls just like like a year ago and you know it's kind of in that area and they were like if you drive up you can see and it's like you wouldn't believe that tornado like literally cleaned the ground everywhere around. you can see exactly where it went there was just nothing left no trees, nothing, wherever it went. Yeah, it was insane. There were cars in the trees. Uh, there was, I mean, I, I, it was just utter destruction right there where it, where it hit and carved through Cookville. So, yeah, that, that was, that was a whole thing. Well, let's maybe end it on a, a better note. You know, I hate that you had to go through that, but it's like you said, it's. It was good that you were there for your family and for all of those people. So I was glad to have been able to. I, I don't know that I'd call what I was doing helping because I, I there wasn't much good that came out of it. Um, but I was, uh, I don't even know the word for it, man. Um, it's not something I would want to ever go through again. But uh, I it it was good to see. Uh, my family all being there together and helping and supporting each other. And it was, it was a, uh, it was a rough one. That was tough. Well, I guess we'll move on to the last question kind of wraps into all of this stuff you've been talking about tonight, which is based on your life experience. What's the best advice you can give those out there listening? Uh, you're listening to advice from somebody who's been snake bitten and shot. So take it with a grain of salt, right? I guess, and this kind of goes back to just life experience as a whole is just get out of your comfort zone. Um, like if I had stayed in my comfort bubble and done what was easy and done what I was comfortable with and played it safe, I wouldn't have seen any of some of the most, most of the most important moments in my life. Um, and, uh, that's when growth happens. That's when progress happens. That's when anything meaningful happens. Um, it's not going to happen when you're comfortable. Um, so say yes to things. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Go do things that you don't think really sound that appealing to you. You might end up liking it. You never know. New experiences are good. Go talk to that person that you think you have absolutely nothing in common with. I, The podcast, man, perfect example. Um, everybody's worth getting to know. Um, some people aren't worth knowing after that. <laughs> but uh, everybody's worth getting something from. Um, so, you know, go out and go talk to people. Go, diversity is good. Um, go talk to people you normally wouldn't. Go do things you normally wouldn't. Um, I, I see, I think that's a big problem nowadays, especially, um, uh, especially down here, um, in the kind of rural South and Knoxville's better than a lot of places. Um, but like I said, you don't got to go far out of here for it to be very rural. And, uh, a lot of those stereotypes that people that aren't from around here have about the South, uh, apply, uh, stereotypes exist sometimes for a reason. It's because some of it's true. Um, and I just see so many people, um, either that I knew back in the day or from a similar situation or from the same place that are just in their safe little bubble and never leave it and don't do anything outside of what they've been doing their entire lives. 
And because of that, they still are the exact same person they were when they were 13. And it's sad, man. Uh, it's, it's sad because I can just imagine everything I would have missed out on if uh, I hadn't gotten out of my comfort zone and been uncomfortable. And don't, don't get me wrong, it's very uncomfortable. And not all of it is going to be pleasant, but you will grow because of it and become a more route, like well-rounded, uh, better, more interesting person. Um, and that's that's probably the advice I got, man. And it's not it's not even like a money thing. I don't have a lot of money. Like I'm not even talking about traveling. Like I would advise everybody to try to travel, but you can stay very close to where you're from and still get out of your comfort zone and grow as a person. Um, so just be open to new opportunities and, and, you know, try out some new things. And that's, that's, that's what propels people forward. And, uh, the more open and diverse and experienced people we have, um, the better the whole world is going to be. So, you know, get out of your comfort zone and go do some stuff. Yeah. Even the small stuff, you know, I've, I love to travel. I love to do all that. And normally it's like the little small things that ends up like leading you on some kind of like completely different life experience. Like you go to a birthday party of somewhere you don't even want to go and you meet somebody that like all of a sudden leads you onto this new path. It's like, I love watching the little branch train. It's like when I go to dodgeball to help out one of my friends. And then the next thing you know, dodgeball has changed my life because I have all these multiple friends or something like that. So don't, a lot of times we like to be like, I'm tired. I just want to stay home the night. Right. I don't, I don't really want to do this, but you can literally miss out on life changing events just by not doing the little stuff too. So it's not all about all big stuff. Just say yes to all you can say yes to, I think. Yeah. I mean, you came to a, uh, dress up Halloween murder mystery dinner party at essentially someone's house you had never even met before. Right. So um yeah and here we are uh talking on a podcast about uh deep interesting things <laughs> probably one of the best episodes i've ever done here <laughs> this one's been fun you've had the um the the squirrel thing with the 45 had me laughing so hard i didn't think i was gonna be able to breathe there what a dumb story like why what made us think that's this that's like the worst on the spot like try to get out of trouble story that's like a six-year-old making up a story to his parents so he doesn't get in trouble and it's to the tbi of a tennessee bureau of investigation <laughs> with a gunshot wound so stupid it's a miracle i made it this far don't get that far out of your comfort zone there is a there's a line you probably shouldn't cross because it gets a little dangerous but you know makes for a good story toe the line what I don't I don't know. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed this. Like I said, I think this is one of my favorite episodes. I knew it was going to be our mutual friend Jessica. I was like, man, I have to get Wes on here because like he's I could just see he's gonna have like some interesting stories, and I was I was not wrong. I I've got all kinds of them, man. Whenever you whenever you want to talk about some crazy stuff, feel free to give me a ring. You might get a part two. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that's fine. Yeah, we can we can talk about same five questions. Can't use the same answers. So I got I got plenty, buddy. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll just end it right there. Thank you again, Wes. Thanks, man. I enjoyed myself. This is a really cool thing you got going on. I I really uh I really think the premise of the five questions with just a wide range of people is super cool concept. I'm sure you're gonna get all kinds of cool cool content and, and cool stuff. So thanks for having me on, man. I want to thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and leave a five star review. Also, check out the video podcast at Handlebar ASMR on YouTube for extras.